I'm Ben Johnson, your host for the experience of God. Did you ever wonder how a spiritual person, a really good man, can live his faith in a world like this? Not only in this world, but how he could be a politician, how he could lead a community and still be doing a spiritual work. If you've wondered that, you'll find this interview very interesting. Join me for another experience of God. Ted Terry, Mayor of Clarkston, Georgia. Yes, sir. My delight to talk with you today. It's my delight, too. I understand that you have a number of different religions in Clarkston. Tell me about some of those, those people who worship God in different ways. Yeah, I've had the, uh, the fortunate <laughs> opportunity, uh, really, it was last summer, uh, with the Clarkston Interfaith Group, uh, you led that, uh, that effort along with some other folks, and we got to visit um, one of the Hindu Buddhist temples, um, Hindu Buddhist temples in uh, the city of Clarkston. We have a, a masjid, a uh, Vietnamese Buddhist temple um, right outside the city limits, um, but still, you know, part of our, our community. Uh, and, um, you know, Baptists, Methodists, International Bible, uh, the whole range of the Christian orthodoxy. So it's, yeah, it's very diverse. And you have Buddhist, Buddhist too. We do, yes. Yes, many different types of Buddhists. When you, when you think about that, um, what, what impressed you about going to a masjid, uh, we would say mosque? Uh, what, what impressed you as you went in and met people and saw the place they worship and that sort of thing? Yeah, you know, to me it was um, very similar to a, a Christian service, maybe a little bit different. Uh, we didn't have pews, uh, we, we sat on the floor. And, um, but, you know, when I greeted people and uh, listened to the sermon from uh, uh, Imam Pl uh, Amin, Pl Pleo Amin? Yes, Pleman T. L. Amin. Pleman T. L. Amin. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, uh, it really struck me that a, a lot of the messages that he was talking about that day, I think we actually attended a... Um, um, Juma. A, a Juma, yeah. yeah. Was, it, uh, was it a funeral service? Is that, no, that Ju was a, a Juma. They happened that day to okay. be having uh, something like a funeral where they shared grief with people. That's right. But yeah. it was really just their regular worship type service. Okay. Well, you know, I, and that's the thing I felt, um, I felt it, it, it was very familiar in terms of how I was raised uh, in the, the Methodist church. Mm -hmm. it, it's something though to see a thousand men walk through the door and kneel on their face before God and pray that. I'm always impressed with that when I go to a masjid. Yeah, it's, it is very impressive. Um, I think the, um, I enjoyed it uh, for one because uh, I think sometimes it's good to kind of get up and kind of move around a little bit. And that just that act of praying and uh, and bending down and up and then down again, um, you know, from a yeah. from a physiological perspective, it's good to kind of get the circulation flowing. <laughs> it keeps you alert. <laughs> but you know, it's it's uh, it certainly is um, to me. It was just uh, it was symbolic. It was it was you know being humble, you know, bowing, not being um, uh, having a little humility, which is is nice. Some of the email that's been crossing my desk has indicated that you have, uh, you and the um, councilman here in Clarkston have signed this pledge or commitment to compassion. That's right. Would you describe what that is and how you think it might help Clarkston? 
Yeah, you know, um, the, the Cities of Compassion idea was started years ago by Karen Armstrong. She gave a TED Talk, I think in 2008, and then really kind of launched this movement uh, worldwide to get other cities, counties, governments to sign this charter. And uh, I was introduced to it last summer. I talked about it when I, when I was campaigning for mayor. And uh, I pledged that it was one of the first things that we would work on um, as, a, uh, as an official resolution for the city. And so the city of Clarkston, the city of Atlanta, those are the first two cities in, the, uh, in Georgia who have signed the Charter of Compassion. It's four paragraphs, it's pretty straightforward, but uh, what struck me about it was it uh, was it, what Clarkston has in common between the spiritualities and ethnicities, and that's the idea of the golden rule, mm -hmm. you know, doing to others as you would have them do unto you, and, and that to me seemed to be kind of the heart of, uh, of, the, of the Charter, and a really good place to start from. Some of the people who are working with you, maybe the interfaith people, or maybe it's some of the leaders in the religious, various religious uh, groups here in Clarkston, maybe, maybe they are doing this, but how do you envision that charter and signing it and uh, publicizing it? How is it possible? What, what could it do to make a difference in life here in Clarkston? Yeah, you know, simply signing the charter uh, is, is, is purely symbolic. You know, they're just words on the paper. But sometimes, and I've noticed this just in Clarkston in the, the, the couple years that I've lived here, um, that if people don't feel like their government or their uh, elected representatives are sort of with them on things they want to do, then it's really hard to get that momentum and energy behind you know, doing something that maybe some people don't agree with. And so the first step is to say that the city supports the idea, um, the ideas that late were laid out in the Charter of Compassion. Mm -hmm. But then from that point on, it's about how do we empower our actual residents, our citizens, our new arrivals, our, um, all, all the faith community on actually doing something. And that's, you know, cr and the first step really is creating an action plan, um, which is something that the Clarkson Interfaith Group uh, has agreed to uh, to begin working on with me and the rest of the of the council. So that you can invite the city to participate in making this compassion real. Exactly. Yeah. There's some things that the city can do to support this. Uh, you know, the ideas in the Charter of Compassion uh, policies um, uh, that. Um, that would make the city more compassionate. But at the end of the day, we're gonna to have to actually just get out there and, and interact with people. And uh, one of the ideas that I really appreciated that came up out of the, the first discussions about the, the Compassionate Cities Charter was how can we uh, work with our youth? And there actually is a youth charter of compassion. It's a little bit different, more geared towards elementary and middle school age kids. But you know, in Clarkston, we have um, two elementary schools and a high school just within the, the immediate area. A lot of kids, a very young population, 75% of Clarkston's under the age of 40. And so this is going to be, I think, an important task for us is to engage the, 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 the youth and the, the younger generation because they're the ones who are going to be, yeah. you know, you know here tomorrow. voting mm -hmm. and, you know, living here, <laughs> running the businesses. Um, and so if we can go into the schools and develop a uh, a, a broader idea of what compassion is, and then actually practice it. You know, there's um, part of the idea of the compassion games, or the uh, compassion charter is the compassion games, and that takes place uh, September 11th for about 10 days, and that's an actual an opportunity for us to put into action some uh, compassion. Yeah, some very you know very small things yeah. uh, count, but you know some some big things as well, yeah. and so. So I think we're going to be kind of working towards, uh, you know, having the city participate more broadly in the Compassion Games. You mean you mentioned the average age in Clarkston and the large number of young people that you have here. Uh, what is what is your view of the city's role in providing for those young people? Say, not just in school, but say those three months the school is out, or a month at Christmas that they are not in school. What? What does the city need to do to help them? Yeah, you know, I was told that at one point in Clarkston's history, you know, we're, we were founded in 1886, so Clarkston's been around for a while. But at one point in our history, a couple of decades ago, we actually had a recreation department, and that was, you know, an opportunity for 
to have, have kids do sports uh, mm -hmm. and activities after school. So to me, you're exactly right. You know, we have to work with the school board and the schools when they're in the classrooms to make sure that they're, they're safe in their schools, that they're able to walk to school safely. Um, but also what happens from three to six every day, what happens during the winter breaks and over the summer breaks. And so I think the city, you know, we've um, done a lot of infrastructure projects recently. We've uh, completely renovated our main park, uh, resodded the soccer field, uh, renovated the baseball and softball field, put in new tennis courts just in the past couple of years, a dog park, uh, all new pavilions for people can, you know, have picnics and, and other little festivals. And uh, we also um, uh, contribute uh, a pretty significant amount of money to the Clarkson Community Center, which is sort of a, you know, another location for recreation after school facilities, uh, you know, for act programs to take place. So I think the city needs to continue supporting those, certainly. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that we are working on over the next four years is actually expanding the walkability and bikeability of the city of Clarkson. So we're going to be putting in more bike lanes. We're working with the PATH Foundation to extend the PATH, uh, which mm -hmm. is the bike path that actually right now it stops at right. Clarkston, and you got to get on the roadway. And so if a, you know if a, if a child uh, wanted to bicycle through Clarkston, uh, they'd have to be either on a side street uh, in traffic um, or on Church Street or Ponce de Leon, which is a you know a major thoroughfare. Um, and then on, on top of that, um, the sidewalks are in desperate need of renovation and repair. So we're we're looking at a, um, a six million dollar street skates project that'll be implemented over the next four years that will connect Milan Park all the way with downtown Clarkston to the western edge of just to the mm -hmm. interstate. And these will be larger sidewalks, benches, pocket parks, um, you know the design elements are still in production. Will you be able to get some grants somewhere to help you with that or does all that have to come out of Clarkston? Yeah, you know, actually the streetscapes was um, a, a grant, an earmark from the federal government that we got several years ago that we finally implemented. But, um, but yeah, we're going to be looking at getting environmental uh, protection grants for just basic, you know, just uh, cleaner air and cleaner water, um, you know, projects. Uh, we're also looking at doing environmental education programs in Friendship Forest, which is our nature preserve. It's an Audubon, mm -hmm. san officially sanctioned Audubon sanctuary. We actually have 50 bird species that live in Friendship Forest. And so there's two programs that we're going to be applying to with the Department of Natural Resources uh, and a private foundation to have uh, wildlife education programs for uh, middle and, um, and elementary school age kids. Um, and actually just two weekends ago we, we planted wildflowers at Friendship Forest and we had a group of kids from Clarkston Station which uh, is a apartment complex near Friendship Forest. Ninety percent are new arrivals from other countries and so it's a, a lot of kids there. So you know, mm -hmm. we're just trying to engage them uh, make them realize they have this amazing, you know, natural resource right there, and we want uh, them to protect it, but also enjoy it and help, you know, make it better. Where have the people you mentioned uh, that there were new arrivals next to the forest? Where, where do people come from that come to Clarkston as refugees? Yeah, you know, they come from all over. Um, <laughs> the the basic sort of snapshot is 40 different nationalities, 60 different languages. Um, it kind of ebbs and flows over the years. It, if you watch the, you know, the nightly news, if you watch the nightly news over the past 30 years and you look at any war zone, genocide, territorial dispute, famine, religious persecution, people from those countries become refugees and are part of the United Nations Refugee Resettlement Program. And since the 1980s, um, the United States has been a part of that program. So Jimmy Carter signed the, the, uh, the Refugee Act in, 1970, in 1980. Ronald Reagan uh, reauthorized it, and it's been authorized every year by every pre American president. So Vietnam, Bosnia, um, Somalia, Somalia, Ethiopia, Atreya, Liberia, um, Sudan, Iraq, Afghanistan, Nigeria. Nigeria. I mean, you know, there's, it, there's, a, a lot of um, people who have come from places that, you know, that weren't, they couldn't, they, they couldn't stay. They were displaced for a reason, 
Um, I think some folks want to go back, um, and that and that actually does happen. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if the things get better back in the home country, they do uh, have the opportunity to go back or to bring other family members over to America. Uh, a number of people know about the boys from Sudan that um, mm -hmm. escaped, and one of those lives in the Clarkston area. Mm -hmm. I had conversation with him, and he wants to go back. He said, I, I want to get a degree at Georgia Tech, mm -hmm. and I want to go back in my country and help rebuild a company, country that's been torn down, yeah. which is a very interesting, interesting thing to me. Uh, I do know that you go into various group, religious groups, uh, churches, mosques. Um, you don't have a synagogue here, but you have a Buddhist gathering place. What, what, what do you say as the mayor when you go into one of these religious settings to present to them who you are and what your vision is for the city? Yeah, you know, um, I think, again, it comes back to this idea of compassion. And uh, that is a subject that no matter what the audi religious audience is and what, you know, actual, you know, doctrines or uh, rituals that they ascribe to this is something that we all can talk about and embrace and from a you know from an elected official from a government perspective uh, you know there is a separation of church and state that's enshrined in our you know um, our country's constitution but that um, doesn't mean that our elected officials shouldn't be a part of the spiritual discussion because there's a lot of what I actually find is when you're gonna get, you know, once you have the service, and you know, most of these religious gatherings have a, a potluck or a, a meal before or after the service, mm -hmm. and then people, you know, what, what does it turn to? It turns to the schools. It turns to, you know, the safety of our neighborhoods. It turns to what are we doing for our kids? What are we doing for jobs? And these are just everyday concerns of, of, of everyday people. It doesn't matter what religion or spirituality mm -hmm. they are. Um, and I found that actually uh, there's a lot of really good ideas and a lot of very motivated people um, who are already in, you know, um, these, uh, you know, in these churches or mosques or, you know, or temples. And yeah. so for me, you know, I want to engage them and I want to say, you know, we can all work together to make this community so much better. We can make this a world class city, um, you know. Uh, if we if we come together on the the things that we do agree on, you know, I think I think it's accurate. At least I want to say that what is everyday issues in the lives of people in this community, like school and safety and jobs and so on, those are spiritual issues as well as just human issues. If it's truly human then it's got to be basically spiritual. I mean, it's, it's, it's more than just one individual. It's a, it's a piece of the whole community that needs looking after and responding to. So yeah. I, think, I think there's a lots of, what I guess I'm saying to you as the mayor, there's a lots of dignity. There's a lots of reward for you to act in a way that liberates people and empowers people and helps them find meaning in their lives. I mean, after all, I'm a minister and that's what I try to do all the time. You know, that's, I have a perspective on that, but you know, most everybody on the street in Clarkston has some perspective on what role God has in their life and who they turn to when things are really bad or they're struggling with an issue they don't know what to do with. or when they wake up one morning and the sun is shining and they just want to say, whoopee, I'm glad to be alive today. Yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm always uh, reminded uh, when I go to spiritual gatherings or restaurants or town hall meetings or just knocking on someone's door, you know, it begins to get, you know, it gets tough sometimes. There's a lot of energy that goes into, you know, listening to someone and then, and then really kind of, you know, taking it in and then thinking about how can we address this one person's concern because um, that that one person um, to them their beliefs and hopes and dreams and ideas are the most important thing in the world and, and my job is to take that opinion and that idea and to to help make it reality and I think of uh, the poet Hafiz who um, who said uh, you know uh, that everyone 
talking is God talking. Why not be polite and listen? Yeah, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so it, I, I try it, to take it, that it, to heart. <laughs> well, it could be God talking. It really could be through the lips of someone else. I think it is. Um, I guess it's a, a difficult question to ask you, but you, if I ask you to think about someone in your everyday life, in this community, you say that person is really modeling what a person uh, could do and be in a community like this. Mm -hmm. Just think of that. I don't want you to name that person. It might okay. be embarrassing. But just name what he or she does that looks like a good community person making a difference in this city. Yeah, you know, I think it's um, it's the uh, it's those daily, those daily private victories um, that we can, you know, win for ourselves and for our community. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you've actually interviewed her. I was thinking about, you know, about Betty, um, mm -hmm. someone who actually, who I think, you know, in my mind is always thinking about what can we do today. And it doesn't matter how seemingly small or insignificant it is, we have to start with those those small things, those simple things. And you know, over time, uh, they they build up to make a, a big difference. So you know, I'm. It's 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 hard to I think you know think about it that way. Sometimes you have to sort of detach yourself from the the actual result because not every day is going to be the greatest day ever necessarily. Or maybe you set out to do something today and you didn't accomplish all those goals. Um, but uh, the people who day in and day out decide, you know, today is a new day and we're going we're gonna to keep on going forward. Uh, that's, that's, what I, you know, that's what I want to encourage and empower more of our folks in Clarkston to, to think. That, 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 is a very good, that is a very good wish for the community. I'm thinking also, though, of all the people that want to help in Clarkston. I think there are lots of people, when they hear about Clarkston, they hear about needs of people, really genuine needs of refugees, say they didn't get a job as quickly as they sh wish they had, they maybe not, they have trouble with the language or they have some illness in the family, all of those things, they want to be helpful. Tell me, tell me uh, what would be the, the rules you say, if you want to help us, don't do this. <laughs> 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 Are there any of those that you've encountered as a, as the mayor of this community? Um, you know, I, um, I mean, I think uh, Clarkston would not be as successful as it has been without the support of people just coming in, uh, whether they're uh, actual nonprofit resettlement agencies or their church groups or um, other religious groups or just, you know, concerned citizens who, you know, want to just, you know, don donate some time Help. or mm -hmm. some clothes. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I think there's, there are, there are no rules on, you know, helping, helping our fellow, you know, community members out. I think, you know, one of the things I really want to impart to anyone who would come to Clarkston is, is to realize that this is, this is not a temporary thing. These are not people who are just going to be here for a couple months and then they're going to just, they're going to go on their way. You know, these are folks who are legal immigrants. They are, uh, they have green card status. They get social security cards. They pay taxes. Um, their kids go to the, the same public schools as some of our kids do. And they are one day, most of them, uh, these new arrivals become Americans, American mm -hmm. citizens. So if we begin to view these new arrivals as, as future, you know, as new Americans and future citizens, I think that helps sort of set the stage for what we really can do to help people. If we donate some clothes and, you know, all right, you know, that, it's good. People do need clothes. There's no doubt about it. Or donate food to the food bank. You know, Clarkston as a city is not a food desert. We have a lot of opportunities for fresh foods uh, and vegetables. Outside the city limits, it's a little, it's a little more difficult. Um, but those are things that we can do, you know, sort of on the day in, day out. Uh, but when we look at the larger issue, we're talking about education policy that um, provides uh, better opportunities for all the different learning types and languages that we have in our schools, um, as well as, I think, uh, just helping entrepreneurs. You know, we have a lot of very business savvy uh, new arrivals who, in a lot of cases, they actually had businesses back home. And so they have a business mind 
but uh, navigating the bureaucracies and the permitting processes of the county, the city, the state and federal governments can be daunting sometimes. And so there is, I think, um, a longer term you know, ask for folks to help us really develop an entrepreneurial class within our new arrivals because they have that spirit and they have that mindset. It's just about learning the rules and getting that mentorship. You know? So if anyone is a successful business owner or you know, has a business degree and feels like they could you know, give some, some mentorship or some knowledge to how to run a business in America, yeah. that, that is a, a huge impact mm -hmm. um, because then we're talking about making people self-sufficient they can hire other people. They can, can grow their, you know, grow their, uh, grow the tax base certainly, uh, but also um, help out yeah. their own community members. I want to shift the center of gravity just a little bit. Right. You have a lot of energy. You have passion. You have a vision. What do you do to maintain yourself? How do you nurture your own spirit and mind and imagination? How do you take care of your body, for example? <laughs> what do you do yeah, you know, to remain uh, healthy and aggressive? Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly, um, you know, I, I have a degree in nutrition, so that's <laughs> I spent four years studying food science and human nutrition. So I, I, tr I think I try to, you know, eat pretty, pretty good. Um, my favorite quote from uh, about food and dieting is from Julia Childs. You know, that old or. Yeah. The old British cook. Yes. Uh, she said, "Everything in moderation, including moderation." <laughs> and uh, you know, some things you can't can be too militant about everything in life. Yeah. Um, and I think that that same sort of idea really applies in um, you know uh, in in just personal re relations and interacting with people out there. You know, in the world, you can't take anything personally. Um, there's a Toltec Indian, Don Miguel Ruz Ruiz. He has a, a book that I really love. I loved. Um, love reading every once in a while called the four agreements and one of those agreements is don't take anything personally and it's 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 a twofold perspective you don't take an offense per personally but you don't also take um, uh, a victory personally as well and it's, it's not about you um, it's in you know the the, f the more that we can uh, detach ourselves from the results or the um, or the ego of what something of how something should be, or how an outcome should play out, um, the more I think balance we're going to be. Mayor, Mayor, <laughs> Mayor Terry, you know I believe you're going to be a mayor for a long time, as long as you <laughs> want to be, and wherever else God sends you. But I think you have some very good commitments there that will nurture your spirit, keep you alive, and keep you focused doing good things for this world. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing this with me and with dozens of other people. Thank you, Ben. Okay.